I call to order the meeting of the Metropolitan Council Transportation Committee for August 22nd, 2022. Our first order of business is approval of the agenda. I'd entertain a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Moved by Council Member Sterner. Is there a second? Second. Second by Council Member Pacheco. Is there any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. And the motion carries. Next, we go to approval of the August 8, 2022 Transportation Committee meeting minutes. Did anyone have any changes or additions? All right, seeing and hearing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes. Motion to approve. Moved by Councilmember Chambliss. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilmember Sterner. Is there any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. And the motion carries. Next, we're on to employee recognition. Uh, General Manager Koistra. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Today, we honor and recognize two individuals for their commitment to our Blue Line customers. Uh, Roland Green, a rail coordinator, and Julie Mickus, a public uh, facilities worker. And like so many of our employees, they acted uh, beyond their duties without any expectation of this recognition. We appreciate that. There are so many of our employees who do. Uh, it's great that they're, I, could, I believe they are both here this evening, and it's great that they're, they're here. And so I will turn this over to Michael McNamara to introduce uh, Mr. Green first and tell us why we are recognizing him today. <clears throat> Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Mike McNamara. I'm the manager of the Rail Transportation Department. And it's my pleasure to introduce Roland Green. Roland Green is the rail coordinator for Metro Transit Light Rail. Um, in October, Roland will celebrate his 15th year anniversary with Metro Transit. He began his career as a part-time bus operator in 2009 and became a full-time instructor in 2013. And since March of this year, Roland has been our uh, rail coordinator. While much of Roland's time is spent uh, coordinating training for the train operators, he still gets out and uh, picks up a little overtime and, and hauls passengers in service on our trains. On June 12th, Roland was southbound approaching American Boulevard Station, and he noticed a, a pedestrian crouched down against the center rail or center fence uh, as he was coming into the station there. Roland immediately applied the emergency brakes and uh, narrowly missed a uh, pedestrian accident there, possibly a fatality. Uh, Rollins' uh, commitment to uh, paying attention out there, um, keeping his mind in the game at all times, uh, in my opinion, after seeing that video, and I wish we could have it here, it was really close. Um, that individual is lucky to still be with us uh, due to Rollins uh, just mm -hmm. paying attention and doing his job out there. Um, let's see, uh, well, Rollin, um, I just want to say thank you. Appreciate your service to the Metro Transit. Thank you, Mike. I also want to present you with the, it's a Metro Transit Rural Operations uh, Challenge coin. Okay. Thank you. And so, nice job out there. Thank you, Mike. And uh, maybe you want to say a couple words or um, introduce your wife? <laughs> uh, well, first, I want to introduce my wife, Robin. It's her birthday today, so. Oh, happy birthday. <laughs> And I feel a little embarrassed sitting here because I was just doing my job. So um, it's nice to get recognized, but I don't think I did anything that we don't teach all of our operators to do. So I just did my part. Very good. Thank you very much. You and thank welcome. you for doing your job very well and helping to train others. It's thank really you. appreciated. Madam Chair, uh, I want to now turn over to Don Rude to introduce uh, Julie Mickus and share her work. And then uh, Don, then and Julie, and then uh, uh, when, when we're finished here, we'll present the plaques. Sounds good. Uh, Madam Chair, Committee members, uh, my name is Don Rood. I'm the manager of the Public Facilities Maintenance Department for Transfer Roads. Uh, I have some prepared things here, but uh, 
<laughs> I think I'm going to go off uh, track here a little bit and uh, just uh, kind of do the uh, same uh, elevator speech I give everybody that comes into our division. Uh, it's difficult work. Physically uh, demanding, you're out in all weather, you're pulling bags of heavy trash, you're cleaning up some terrible stuff, and it goes on and on. Uh, and it's mentally challenging because <laughs> you can do your work uh, with attention to detail, and before you leave where you're working, it could be all messed up again. So it's a difficult task to go back to that every day. Anyhow, Julie's been with us for uh, five years now, celebrated five years. Yep. She joined uh, the facilities maintenance department uh, in 2020, uh, prior to all of the difficulties we've had, the pandemic and the civil, civil unrest. Uh, and I gave her that elevator speech. Little did I know that it was going to be intensified. <laughs> she works uh, one of the most difficult jobs we have at facilities maintenance. It's CX360 position. And this is uh, dealing with particularly stressed locations in our system, uh, Lake and Hiawatha, Franklin, <laughs> Nicollet. Uh, Warehouse. Yeah, warehouse. <laughs> How could I forget? Uh, they're difficult positions, uh, and it's a it's a tough task. Uh, she's asked to do a lot, and she has not only done a lot in what I think is a division that uh, really does a lot. There are a lot of heroes, but she stands above, and. Uh, she cleans the platforms, areas, uh, graffiti, litter, uh, takes pride in her work. And I, I can drop in there, and I do frequently, and I can tell she's been there, even if it's a disaster. Uh, you know, you just can tell that it's been worked on recently, and it's Julie. Uh, but she does more than clean. Um, with uh, the folks that hang out down there are unfortunately uh, kind of in, in a bad position, a lot of them. Not all of them, of course, but uh, as uh, General Manager Koyster said early in his career at a meeting I was at, and I, I always think about this, uh, we're the last open door. And uh, she takes care of those people, uh, treats them with respect, knows them by name, they know her by name. Uh, it's really a remarkable act of service. And I couldn't be more proud. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. It, it feels really good to be recognized. Um, it can be hard, especially at Lake, especially at Franklin, but it can be really rewarding too. It's, it's good to be a constant in people's lives. You know, little people on their way, you know, to the babysitter, regular people that maybe don't speak English real well. You know, if you're there five days a week, they rely on you. The people that kind of live there, it's the same with them too. I mean, if they have a problem, they will come and talk to me. And can I always help? No, but I can always listen. So, so thank you, Mrs. Thank, thank you. I'm 
so glad we've been able to bring back the employee recognition. It's really nice to see all the faces of the people who really do all the hard work. And so it's just very nice. So thank you. Um, we're on to reports. Our first is MTS Director Crawford. Thank you, Madam Chair. A uh, few updates for the committee tonight. Um, the U.S. Department of Transportation announced uh, the RAISE grants last week, uh, major infrastructure grants. There's a handful of grants around the state, but two in the metro area, uh, 12, million, 12 million for Hennepin County uh, for roadway and pedestrian improvements along Lake Street, uh, which would be a, a complement to the transit infrastructure installed through the B-Line project. So very well-timed uh, award there. And then $15 million to the city of Plymouth uh, for a multimodal trail under Highway 55 for mobility hub improvements, inline transit, spots, uh, transit stops, and road improvements uh, at County Road 73 and Highway 55. So a significant transformation to that area's infrastructure as a result of this grant. Additionally, the FTA announced last week uh, low and no emission grants. So three providers had submitted grant applications, MVTA, Metro Transit, and Southwest Transit, and the Southwest Transit grant application was funded around $8 million. So the council has budgeted the match to this grant uh, and will bring new types of electric buses to the region, uh, both the large over-the-road coach buses uh, in electric form as well as the region's first small buses uh, that are electric. So. Um, uh, continuing to, to um, show pilot projects with this uh, emerging technology. On the contracted services side, uh, today the council restored transit service to the city of Lakeville that had been uh, suspended since early 2020 due to the pandemic. Uh, so this route, 467, uh, was restored as a contracted service by MTS. Uh, we operate six trips each period directly on I-35 from Lakeville to downtown and really a big team effort for the council. So uh, the five coach buses used in the service were transferred from Metro Transit, uh, as well as facility reactivation uh, at the Kenrick Park and Ride uh, from the facility team at Metro Transit. Uh, so no report yet on usage, but we'll track this service as it's underway and are uh, glad to bring the, this service back to the city of Lakeville. With that, Madam Chair, I can stand for any questions. Thank you. Um, council Member Chambliss. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, Director Carlson, I'm just curious about um, the advertisement that's gone on to residents about the um, opening of that service. Uh, great question, uh, Council Member Chambliss, Madam Chair. Uh, it was announced as part of the broader service changes uh, that Metro Transit has done. There was also a lot of interest from the city of Lakeville, so uh, they may have been promoting it as well, but it would, would really just be advertised as part of the regular service changes uh, underway for the part of the quarterly, quarterly pick. Uh, that took effect on Saturday. Okay, any additional questions or comments? All right, thank you, Charles. Um, now we'll move on to uh, Metro Transit General Manager Kolstra. Madam Chair and members, I'll begin with a reminder that the quarterly service changes uh, went into effect on Saturday. Uh, and currently we are uh, at 37 operators short of, of our ideal for that for that service level that just that just began. So uh, we continue to manage service to align with to align with our operator levels, and we'll continue that will continue to guide decisions as we think about this, the December pick. But we're also continuing our efforts to to recruit operators. We've had events. We were at the Mall of America. I know uh, we're we're going to operator uh, hiring and other position need hiring is going to be a, uh, our primary emphasis at the state fair, but with our state fair presence. So we're working really hard down the path of trying to address some of these workforce shortages. Also wanted to provide this group with an update on the uh, uh, one of the set, uh, safety and security action plan elements, and that was the piloting of two-car light rail trains. The pilot period officially ended on Friday, and we're now processing and evaluating um, feedback from our customers and from our employees. And then we had other operational metri metrics we, we had said we would look at in terms of part of that feedback uh, you know, on, on a uh, informal basis, I've heard many good things about it. I know there were some customers who were concerned uh, even before before it started. We'll see where that landed after the pilot took place, but uh, I received a lot of good feedback on it. So I'll be anxious to actually look at the data rather than the than the, than the individual feedback that I that I received. 
Uh, in the meantime, uh, we're going to be using two car trains, continue to use two car trains when the capacity uh, isn't a concern. And we'll certainly add three car trains like yesterday when we had, I think, a United game and, a, and an event at US Bank and, and Target Field. I think when those, when we have needs, we're going to have a three car train out there. I know we've talked also about, about making sure that Green Line has uh, three car trains at the opening of the of the uh, uh, of the university um, uh, classes, uh, so that because they're, they're because of the U pass, we want to make sure we have enough train capacity out there. So we're going to be monitoring closely and adding three car trains when we think there might be a risk, a capacity risk, and kind of maintaining two car trains otherwise. And then finally, uh, I want to also uh, mention the. The, uh, Metro Transit, the Metro Transit participated in Governor Walls' public safety uh, press event on August 11th. Uh, he held this event at U.S. Bank Stadium uh, to describe ongoing work to support public safety across, his uh, across the state. Uh, while the primary emphasis of, of, the press, of the press event was on the work of DPS and, the, and re as represented by the governor and Commissioner Harrington, uh, patrol Captain Captain Raymond provided an update on Metro Transit's efforts to be visible and active on our system. And I just want to thank the staff who supported this because we received this event notice about a day in advance, mm. I mean, no more than a day in advance. And it takes a lot of work. Uh, it takes uh, a team of operations, police, facilities, and communications to make these things work. And I want to I want to call out that effort because uh, it was it was a 24 note hour notice <coughs> coverage event and. That always makes us uh, want to be at our best, of course. <coughs> so, so with that, I'll, I'll stand for questions. Thank you. Questions or comments from council members? All right. Seeing and hearing none, we'll move on to the tab report. We have Mr. Dugan here. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Madam Vice Chair, Honorable Council Members, General Manager Koistra. Oh, and of course, Director Carlson. My apologies. Uh, if I'm Going off script, uh, a gentleman in Coyster, I can't tell you how impressed I am with your people. It's just, the, their level of dedication and selflessness uh, and bravery is just, I'm just glad I'm not applying. <laughs> I'm not sure I'd get in. I'm sure I wouldn't get in. Okay. Uh, a couple of updates to the summary report that Elaine uh, uh, sends us. On the to toward zero death uh, update, as of August 14th, 250 people have been killed. That is down 11% but is up over the five-year average. Most concerning, though, is that motorcycle deaths have increased one-third in the last year and up 90% since 2019. Uh, no rationale has been uh, generated yet on that. And Mr. Carlson mentioned the Rebuilding America Infrastructure Sustainability Equ Equity Act, the RAISE Act. I did have to look that up. I did. <laughs> and under the MAC report, uh, Elaine called me to restate that if Terminal 2, Humphrey, were a standalone terminal, it would be the 58th largest in the country. And between Terminal 1 and Terminal 2, Lindbergh and Humphrey, 20, over 25 million passengers were served 2021. Uh, with the suggestion and advice of the chair, um, I thought I would go through uh, a brief overview of the regional solicitation where we are now. The regional solicitation is comprised of 12 categories, and I'll briefly go through them. The first, the first couple, first four, are, are actually first five, are all traffic related. So the first one is technologies, traffic management technologies, uh, you know, to reduce delays, emissions, such things as updated traffic signals, signal detectors for vehicles and people. The next is spot mobility and safety. This is making road intersection improvements, uh, typically new turn lane roundabouts. The next is strategic capacity. Now, this refers only to regionally significant road expansion, new lanes, highway intersections. The next is reconstruction and modernization. So we have, we have capacity, then we have modernization. And modernization refers to improving pavement, uh, raised median, safety elements for bicyclists and pedestrians. Bridge, re bridge re rehabilitation and reconstruction is self-explanatory. The next several, the next three categories are transit expansion. Transit expansion, and I'll ask Mr. Uh, General Major Koistra to augment if I 
say it incorrectly, uh, the main purpose of transit expansion is to attract new riders, uh, improve bus routes, expanded park and rides, and transit stations. The second is transit modernization. As a this is meant to in, uh, make transit more attractive by improving times and the customer experience. And then the, uh, the one with actu actually no category is travel demand management, and that uh, is the program that uh, Councilmember Chaco, Councilmember Sterner went to, and I believe Chair Barbara went to uh, last Wednesday, is to determine what are alternative ways of getting around the city, reducing vehicle miles traveled, and uh, uh, and emissions. The next is what is called bike ped, um, self-explanatory. Uh, here we have trail bridges and underpasses to make things more safely. The next are pedestrian facilities. This is primarily improvements to address walkability, but also people with disabilities so they can have access and mobility. And the last is safe routes to school, self-explanatory for K through 12, but must be within two miles of the school. And then I will briefly go through the application summary of where we are right now. Um, in terms of timing, um, the scores have been received and scored. Last uh, Thursday, the uh, TAC funding and programming reviewed the appeals and all five were approved. In September, the final ranking will be done by TAB and funding sources. As you know, TAB has some flexibility to determine uh, how to allocate the funds. And in December, uh, the, the recommendations will come to this committee for your approval. Uh, in, in the roadway category, just a roadway, that's technology, safe spot mobility, strategic reconstruction, bridge. Uh, 61 applications, 327 million. Uh, and the TAB budget is around 190, give or take. Uh, the roadways occupy anywhere from 46 to 65 percent of the funding. So if you have 100 percent, their range is 46 to <clears throat> 46 to 65. <clears throat> Excuse me. The next are the transit and travel demand management uh, programs. They get 25 to 35. Uh, 21 projects, 89 million. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Bicycle pedestrian. 9 to 20 percent range, 69 applications for 167 million. Unique projects, which is a, uh, a different category this year, which is to get to uh, address a, a need that is not within the others but is looking forward, is two and a half percent of the but of the 200 million, and there were uh, four applications for 588 million. Well, we're way over budget. <laughs> uh, okay, and then in terms of a summary, comparing 2022 to 2020, uh, the applications are up over by 30, and the amount requested was about 130 million more. Uh, the what we call unique and different different applicants, folks that may have not applied before or coming from a, a unique organization, there were 45 of those. The counties. Seven counties had 56 applications among them. The cities, 27 applied with 63 applications. Two park districts with 14 transit providers, uh, three, uh, th three transit providers, which would include the suburban transit folks, 15 applications, four nonprofits, and then one state of Minnesota and one Met Council. And that, Madam Chair, is my report, and I could stand for questions. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Again, that was very helpful. Um, I have one quick question. In the, the transit um, uh, dollars, does that include the $25 million set aside? Oh, you're right. Answer? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I, I rehearsed this with her beforehand, so she's got, she's got my back. Thank you. Yes. Uh, in the, <laughs> under the, I hope you all can hear me. <clears throat> anyway, under the transit uh, is the $25 million reserve for ABRT in order to uh, get the project done in one fell swoop, rather than over, used to be, what, seven million over four uh, cycles. Thank you, I appreciate okay. that. Okay, thank you. Um, questions from council members? Thank you all. Thank you very much. Good that to was see very you all. Um, now we are on to our consent agenda. There are three items on consent, so I'd entertain a motion to approve the items on consent. 
I make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Moved by Councilmember Sterner. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilmember Member Fredson. Is there any other discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. And the motion carries. We're next on to non consent business. The first one is business item 2022 220, results of the Title VI service equity analysis for D line. And we have Cindy Harper here to present. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Um, my name is Cindy Harper. I am the manager of route planning for Metro Transit in our service development division. And today I'd like to talk a little bit about the Metro D line as well as the local bus service that also operates in that corridor and our plans for that service. So just as we did when the Metro A and C lines were getting ready to open, staff has reviewed what changes are recommended on the other bus routes that are in the same corridor um, and what should happen when our newest BRT line, the D line, opens later this year. I have a combination of a business item and an informational item for your consideration this evening. Uh, the action required is that the Met Council approve the results of the Title VI service equity analysis for the Metro D-Line and related service, local service changes. Um, and we will come back to this. However, before we review the results of the equity analysis for the service changes, I'd first like to outline what those plan changes are. As a quick reminder, the D-Line is scheduled to open at the end of the year. It's approximately 18 mile corridor connecting uh, Brooklyn Center, Minneapolis, Bloomington and Richfield. It will substantially replace today's Route 5, but it's about 20% faster for travel time. Um, service will be every 10 to 15 minutes and the stations are approximately every one third to one half mile apart. So we've kept these guiding principles in mind as we were considering potential changes on local routes in the D-Line corridor. First, we need to be realistic in how much service can be provided given our ongoing operator shortage. This is really key, and I'd like to emphasize that the changes I'm describing here today are what we would like to do, but are always subject to change as our operator situation, as our operator situation fluctuates. We looked carefully at various demographic data, especially in between the D-Line stations where riders will need to travel an extra block or two. The map on the right highlights areas where a higher percentage of people with disabilities are living along Route 5. Also need to balance the desire to provide uh, coverage in between the D-Line stations with the likelihood that most of the riders are going to shift to the D-Line. And then finally, it's important to keep continuity with the planning and outreach process, which started back in 2016 for this project. Metro Transit has worked hard to build and maintain relationships with our riders and other stakeholders. During the planning process, when people would ask what's, what's gonna happen to the local service in the corridor, what's happening to the five, we said that we would plan to keep some local service in the corridor, but cautioned that we would need to revisit this issue as opening day got closer. So I'd like to walk through the changes that are planned. First, um, north of downtown Minneapolis. There's two maps here. The one in the middle is the current service. And the one on the right is the planned service. There's changes for three different routes on the north side. Uh, route five, which on the middle map is the map, or is the route shown in red. Uh, the D-Line will be the primary service in the corridor, but the route five will continue to operate as a demonstration route. Uh, it would run less frequently than it does today, every 30 to 60 minutes. Um, and also there would no, there'd be no service proposed on the F branch, which is 26th Avenue North in North Minneapolis between roughly uh, Fremont, Emerson Fremont and West Broadway. Um, nearly all of the riders that are on this branch are less than a quarter mile from alternative service, either on Broadway, Penn or Fremont. Routes 721 and 724, which are the orange or brown lines on the middle map there, um, they will not have any service south of the Brooklyn Center Transit Center between BCTC and downtown Minneapolis, including along Dowling Avenue between 94 and Fremont. The D-Line will have very similar, um, uh, it's, the service will be replaced by the, the, the D-Line, which is a very similar running time, travel time, so there really isn't the need for two different limited stop services in the same corridor. The Route 724 service between Brooklyn Center Transit Center and downtown has been suspended since March of 2020. 
Um, and I'd like to point out there are no changes planned to either the Route 721 or the 724 north of the Brooklyn Center Transit Center. Those, those, those items remain exactly the same. And our, our last piece, um, our third piece here is Osseo Road, which is on the border between Brooklyn Center and North Minneapolis. The council amended the D-Line station plan back in April to include the new station at Osseo and 47th Avenue North. Um, so our plan is to have the Route 5 continue to serve Brooklyn Center Transit Center during construction next year on Osseo Road. But then the plan is not to run the Route 5 north of 47th Avenue um, after the construction is complete because the new station will be there to fill the gap. So moving south of downtown, maps are set up the same way with existing service in the middle and planned service on the right. Uh, Route 5, once again, is represented by the red line on the center map. Um, and one of the main changes on this route on, in South Minneapolis is that the service <laughs> will end at 56th in Chicago. Uh, all along, we've never said that we would keep the local service on Route 5 all the way to the Mall of America. But in the early stages of the planning process, um, we did show some service south of 56th Street going into Richfield. However, in the end, the station spacing through Richfield in the approved final station plan provides good transit access with the D-Line without the need to have additional underlying service along Portland Avenue. Also, I'd like to note the temporary routing near 38th in Chicago for both the Route 5 and the D-Line, uh, and that will continue. There's two other routes, uh, Route 39, which is pretty hard to see on this middle map. It's a uh, green line to just <coughs> travels just as far south as Lake Street, so the very, very top of the map. And Route 133, which is the blue line, um, both are being replaced by the D line, and they have been suspended since March of 2020. Um, the travel time difference, much as the situation was on the north side with the routes 721 and 724, the travel time difference with the D line is, is, is uh, virtually nothing, and so there's, it would be considered duplicative. We did some outreach earlier this summer to get the word out, especially about the changes on Route 5. We developed a one-pager, which was also translated into Spanish, and that one-pager is attached to today's business item. Uh, we also took advantage of the D-Line website to post additional information about the changes and some of the rationale behind those decisions, and then also engaged the media, which included an article in the Minnesota Spokesman Recorder. We got the word out by riding the bus and talking to riders at key stops. We spent about 15 hours out in the field. Also, there was an article in the D-Line newsletter, and we sent an electronic rider to alert to all customers who are signed up to receive notifications about any of the routes here that we're talking about this afternoon. And then finally, we also made sure to post the one-pager various points throughout the community, um, various uh, bullet, community bulletin boards and other, and other gathering spots. In terms of the feedback, we didn't hear much about the specific changes that were being proposed, um, especially on, on Route 5. Most of what we heard was concern about change period, which of course is, is human nature. Uh, but when we actually took the time to explain to people what is, plan what is planned to change, then they were okay with what we were, what, what we were telling them. Uh, I'd like to note that the full engagement report is available out on the D-Line website if you're interested in more information. Okay, circling back now to our business item. These planned changes rise to the level of a major service change based on council policy. That means that the Federal Transit Administration requires us to perform what's called a service equity analysis prior to implementation in order to understand how the impacts of these changes differ for communities of color and for low income groups, which are both protected by Title VI of the Civil Rights Act in 1964. The threshold to determine if a difference in impacts is considered discriminatory is also set in council policy known as the 80% rule. White non-low income populations must bear at least 80% of the adverse effects borne by communities of color and low income groups. And on the flip side, uh, BIPOC and low income residents must also share in the benefits of service improvements. They must receive at least 80% of the benefits experienced by white non-low income riders. 
or residents, excuse me. And I would like to note that the council is currently taking feedback on a proposal that would raise this threshold uh, from 80% to 90%. You'll hear more about this in the fall. So the results of the service equity analysis showed that the average person living in the service area will benefit from an increase in trips regardless of their race or income. And the average uh, black indigenous or other uh, people of color or low income resident experiences a greater increase than white or non low income residents. Therefore, no disparate impact or disproportionate burden. The executive summary from this report is also attached to the business item and the full report with a lot of different maps is available online if you're interested. So the proposed action today is that the Met Council approved the results of the Title VI service equity analysis for the Metro D-Line and related service changes. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Cindy. Are there questions from Council members? Thank you, Chair. This, uh, one of my questions was there was a concern by uh, one of the customers that there might be changes on the east-west part of routes with it. Are there any changes with the uh, feeder type system to the D-line which formerly went to the Route 5? Uh, count, uh, Chair Barber and, and Council Member Sterner, no, there are no changes planned um, outside of what I've talked about here today. So any of the east route east-west routes that intersect with um, Plymouth, not Plymouth, I'm sorry, with Chicago Avenue in South Minneapolis or with Emerson Fremont Avenues in North Minneapolis. Um, we don't have any, any plans to make changes to those routes when the D-line opens because of, of the D-line. Thank you. All right, additional questions or comments? Right, I've just got a couple then. Um, what's the plan for communicating this going from now through December to make sure that riders are well informed of the changes kind of as we roll out the D-line? Um, thank you, Chair Barber. That's a really good question. So this, the local changes here will be wrapped into the larger outreach that's happening for the Metro D-line um, overall, which of course will be a very big deal for our, our marketing communications department to get the word out. We're pretty excited about the opening of this line. It's been under construction for the last couple of years. So we will make sure that we put special effort into um, making sure that the riders on the service today, especially those who are perhaps using stops that are not going to be a D-line station, understand um, where they go to catch the D-line service instead or understand what the new level of service is on the Route 5 for those who are unable or unwilling to, to go the little extra distance over to the D-line station. Um, so we'll a variety of me messages for that, everything from bus stop postings um, to uh, uh, electronic rider alerts to social media, um, just a, a variety of different channels. And it'll also be part of our bigger um, December pick service changes in general, much like um, uh, Councilmember Chambliss, you were asking about earlier with uh, the August changes. Thank you. I've got one other last question. So you mentioned that um, coming before us eventually will be a different threshold. Mm -hmm. um, I, you may not be able to answer this because it's still in development, but does this meet that? Yes. Okay. Good to know. <laughs> I believe so. I will double check that, but I'm, yes, sure. I believe it does because it actually exceeds, it's a, it only, be, yes, uh, that only becomes an issue if the percentage of service improvement um, in this case were to be higher for um, white non-Hispanic residents or for non-low-income residents. And in this case, it's actually higher for um, low-income residents and for communities of color. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. All right, final call. Additional questions, comments? Uh, seeing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve business item 2022-220. Motion to approve. Moved by Councilmember Chambliss. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilmember Fredson. Is there any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 No, motion carries. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you. Next, we're on to business item 2022-223. It's a transportation addendum to the Metropolitan Council Public Engagement Plan, and we have Sarah Maskey here to present. Thank you, Chair and committee members. Um, so we had uh, a presentation on this earlier this spring, so I'll just give you an update as to where we are. Um, as part of this update, uh, the staff is recommending that the federally required transportation public participation plan 
document be adopted as the addendum to the Met Council's public engagement plan rather than as a standalone document. <clears throat> the draft plan was released for public comment and comments were collected over a 45 day public comment period. I'm fogging up, sorry. <laughs> that started on May 25th and ended on July 11th. Uh, there was a public hearing at the Met Council Transportation Committee on Gen June 25th, as I'm sure you recall, we had one person attend. And the public comment report includes responses to the comments received. And just to give you a little bit of a summary, we did have nine commenters and uh, logged in 18 comments. Um, we had groups and agencies that were involved were MN350 and uh, Carver County. And just a little bit of a summary of some of the themes. Um, there was a request to maintain a virtual option to attend Met Council and Advisory Committee meetings and provide public comments. Um, they asked for transparency in public comments and how they do or do not impact Met Council decisions, shift from public engagement to community influence, um, promoting public comment periods on Met Council assets, including onboard transit and platform digital advertising, um, and recognizing public comments and public engagement from locally adopted transportation plans and planning processes. Well, these did not result in any substantive changes to the draft plan. The responses to these, um, we are looking into a way that we could potentially have a partnership with local governments to be able to log some of these uh, public engagement and public comment opportunities um, as they're related to specific projects, um, the transportation plans or other, other documents that local governments go out for public comment on. Um, <clears throat> I spoke with Metro Transit about advertising on uh, the advertising on our assets. So the transit stations uh, and platform and digital advertising were what was re recommended. Um, and it sounds like the two that are probably a best fit are the digital, the digital uh, screens at the stations and then the in interior of the buses. Um, and then just as far as the maintaining a virtual option, as you're aware, all of our, our meetings are streamed. We do not currently have a virtual option for people to attend the meetings. I know that there are conversations happening at a higher level than myself about this particular topic, um, and we'll continue to, uh, to update folks as that, as that changes. So with that, um, I will take any questions. Thank you, sir. Are there any questions or comments? Councilmember Chambliss. Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I just um, I'm glad that I'm glad to hear this update, and um, I did like the uh, recommendation to look at expanding the way that we look at public engagement and expanding the opportunity for community influence. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that that um, if that is if that name change is not adopted, that uh, it gets incorporated into strategy. And then, uh, as well, I was happy to hear about the partnership uh, with local government in terms of how we do engagement. Um, I think it's a good way for us to identify intersections and best practices. 100%. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, additional questions or comments? Okay, then I'd entertain a motion to approve business item 2022-223. So moved. Moved by Councilmember Fredson. Is uh, there a second? Second. I am a Councilmember Stringer. Is there any other discussion? All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. And the motion carries. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. All right. With that, that concludes our actual business for the mm -hmm. evening. Um, we do have a couple of information items, but um, I think both of those items can proceed to the Council on Consent, if my committee members agree. All right, very good. Um, so now we'll move on to our information items. The first is the statewide multimodal transportation plan, and we have Steve Peterson and uh, Hallie Turner from Minda here. Welcome. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. And just a brief brief introduction of Hallie, uh, who's really been a, a tremendous uh, partner over the past year plus that uh, the statewide multimodal transportation plan has uh, been in development. We've had presentations to TAC planning, TAC, TAB, 
the council, probably uh, probably near and close to 10 presentations. So really good uh, input and cooperation with our partners here at MnDOT. So I did want to thank them for that. Uh, she'll go through a couple of the key changes uh, that that may eventually flow into the transportation policy plan. So uh, they're on a different schedule than we are. So sometimes they advance the ball on an issue and then we advance it and, and kind of keep building off that. So with that, uh, Hallie, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, members. I am very grateful to be here. Steve is correct. I've done a number of presentations, including two previous ones to you all, and I will have quick updates on that as well. But without further ado, really quick overview of what is the SMTP. I'm going to use that acronym SMTP to keep things short, uh, just in case there's anyone streaming who has not heard of this plan before. The SMTP answers how are we going to achieve the Minnesota Go vision. The Minnesota Go vision is on a 50-year horizon that says the, the multimodal transportation system maximizes the health of people, the environment, and the economy. And the SMTP sets forward the objectives, performance measures, strategies, and actions that provide what we call the policy direction to modal and system plans. Steve did a great job talking about at some point, like one person will carry a ball. We do review uh, MPO plans as background information for the SMTP. So we reviewed the content from 2040, the most uh, Thrive MSP 2040, and the most recent TPP. Now we're putting forward our policy direction as we update the TPP uh, and Thrive MSP for, for 2050, they'll take the policy direction as guidance for that as well. So it's a bit of an iterative process in addition to the SMTP providing guidance directly to MnDOT modal and system plans. Uh, to keep it really brief, I'm going to focus on the key changes since the 2017 plan, and we put it in three buckets, climate, equity, and health. Starting first with climate, we have several performance measures, strategies, actions that say that we need to shift to more climate-friendly transportation options. Uh, many of our commitments here focus on performance measures because we know we manage what we measure. First is a greenhouse gas emission target of net zero by 2050. Our horizon year for this plan is 2040, so it would be 80% reduction by 2040. To be very clear, we're already behind. So we require substantial work. Our transportation system needs to look different to be able to meet that target, which includes the next bullet of 100% zero emission light duty vehicles sold by 2040. Don't quote me on this. I should remember I don't. I think we're at like 4%, 5%. We're single digits. So we also need substantial uptake in light duty vehicles as zero emission to be able to contribute to the greenhouse gas emission target as well. Uh, just quick note, zero emission includes electric vehicle. Electric vehicle is the technology that we have available to us today. Zero emission was more inclusive of the technologies that we hope will be deliver delivered to help us meet this target. I'll share a little bit more about vehicle miles traveled per capita uh, in just a moment, but 14% per capita reduction by 2040. This is aligning with the Sustainable Transportation Advisory Council recommendation for 20% by 2050. And then we also uh, need to develop some measures around system and asset resiliency. We know that we need our system to be more resilient in the face of climate change, and we need to measure accordingly so that we can inform decision making. But let's pause a moment for VMT. I just want to send a quick thanks. I don't know if my colleague Nissa Tupper is streaming. She has been carrying the ball for the VMT target reduction for, I think, a year and a half. And now that it's <coughs> in the SMTP, I'm managing communications until the SMTP is adopted. So I want to be very clear that VMT reduction is not a mandate. It's not a dictate. We're not telling people that you cannot travel. The focus is on increasing transportation options expressly to support equity, safety, and healthy communities. So we'll join a suite of other performance measures and targets that help us to manage our transportation system focused on operations and ultimately moving towards increasing real tangible options for people to meet their daily needs. It includes things like increasing walking, increasing biking, providing transit, better transit, uh, a lot of roles that the Met Council plays and helping make sure our transportation system works for Minnesotans. Just to let you know where are we currently uh, or where is our target currently, we are very much in alignment with the proposed, if not adopted, 
Uh, BMT targets here locally, many jurisdictions in the Twin Cities have adopted their own. We are also kind of middle of the pack for national BMT targets as well. So uh, a little bit on the emerging edge, but by no means extremely progressive because we're in the middle of what other people are proposing. The second of three buckets, equity, we had started the Advancing Transportation Equity Initiative in 2018 and have done a lot of work around research, listening sessions, et cetera, in that time that informed the content that is in the draft plan, starting first with a statement of commitment. This is a follow-up to the presentation that Abdullahi Abdullah gave to you all about a year ago about the transportation equity definition. I'll share a little bit more about the evolution of that in one slide. And then just wanna note that we have several strategies and actions that are aimed at building our collective capacity to advance transportation equity. It's one thing to have language about around what we're trying to do. It's another thing to know how to do it. So our strategies and actions, hopefully, you'll find focus on the how. And we also need transportation equity performance measures to help inform decision making. So a quick pause on the transportation equity definition. Uh, when Abdullahi Abdullah was with you about a year ago, we were focused on getting your reactions to a draft transportation equity definition. Since then, it has evolved to be what we call a statement of commitment, and it's in four parts starting first with an acknowledgement of the harm of our transportation system. We know that the legacy of our transportation system is very layered and textured, and we wanted an explicit acknowledgement of that. We then have the MnDOT definition, a statement of commitment that lays out the work that we know that we need to do as an agency, and then a list of terms, because we have lots of terms like BIPOC uh, that's in the statement of commitment, so we have terms that helps to explain that. The, we evolved from a definition to a statement of commitment twofold. One, it deepens our commitment as an agency, makes us own it a little bit more, and allows us to be less prescriptive to our partners. So partners are more than welcome to use some of the same language, but we encourage people to find and adopt their own. The statement of uh, commitment without the list of terms is uh, available in full on the last slide of your presentation if you would like to read that language. And then the third of three buckets, health. Uh, we have also been doing more work around public health over the last five years, and we wanted to make sure that we were in improving health outcomes and reducing disparities. We, many of our commitments focus around what we call a safe system approach. We had heard from a committee member from TAB, name escaping me, about towards zero deaths. Uh, this is a, an evolution of deepening of, it's not necessarily a replacement to the towards zero death framework, but instead an acknowledgement that humans are vulnerable in their decision making and we're vulnerable to kinetic energy. So safe system approach focuses on designing a system that acknowledges those vulnerabilities. We have a target to increase walking and biking to 60% by 2040. Again, we're very low, I think maybe in, I think also single digits. So to be able to get to 60%, we know that short trips, some short trips will need to be made by walking or biking and not single occupant vehicle, although we don't differentiate between recreation and transportation um, decisions for this target. Uh, and then we want to do some work around extreme heat islands. Very timely, as there was a news article last week, that at least two counties by 2035 in Minnesota will see heat index days of up to 125 degrees. We know that the impervious service from transportation system exacerbates high heat, and we have a lot of opportunity to mitigate and hopefully minimize uh, those impacts. Um, that was the quick and dirty on what's changed since 2017, the last time we adopted the SMTP. Just wanted to note that there are a number of commitments that absolutely stay the same. We continue to be committed to inclusive and collaborative processes, maybe reflective of the many conversations that I've had with you all over the last two and a half years. We remain committed to ensuring a safe and convenient movement for people and goods. We want to make sure that we are preserving the system that we have while strategically making improvements uh, for mo more modes, et cetera, but we're committed to the system that we have first and that we need to continue to consider social, environmental, and economic impacts, which I think really relates to the Title VI information that we just heard. We are currently in the public comment period with a public hearing on September 7th. 
We will be available in person at central office near the Capitol, as well as online via web conference. We will be incorporating comments throughout the fall, hopefully with a fall adoption. I really hope this is the 2022 SMTP and not the 2023 SMTP. So my hope is for uh, before end of year adoption. My call to action for you all is to submit comments by September 18th. Met Council staff did a very thorough review of our draft plan in April. I am sure that I will have pages and pages and more comments coming because uh, they were very th thorough in their uh, comment, thorough and pointed in their comments, which I always appreciate. Uh, so I will hand it over to you, Chair, after two acknowledgments. Uh, I just want to thank Chair Zelli for participating in our Policy Advisory Committee, Amy Venowitz for participating in our Technical Advisory Committee, it should be three, and uh, tons of gratitude for staff who participated in our work groups, reviewed documents, participated in staff-to-staff -staff meetings. Over to you, Chair. Very good. Thank you, Hallie. Uh, questions, comments from Council Members? Councilmember Stern. Well, thank you, uh, Chair. I just had a, a couple. The first one they ha had to do is with electric vehicles. We're looking at, but we're also looking at fuel cells vehicles as well as an uh, opportunity. Chair, committee member, uh, committee members, we are uh, we are not prescriptive about the technology because we know that a lot of the technology is being delivered by private enterprise. So we opted for more vague, vague language zero emission vehicle uh, to allow space for innovation to happen and for us to not artificially direct innovation accordingly. Thank you. A couple. Go ahead, All right. Sitter. All right, thank you. Um, I was wondering about the ports and waterways plan. Are you, you work with that or, or who is working with uh, that part of the plan and what is what are some changes look like that for the getting the, towards zero emission and that? Yeah, we. I am not. Chair, committee members, I am not your expert in ports and waterways. Uh, I do know that several of our plans are either in the process to be updated after we adopt this plan or will soon be updated. I believe it's in the document, ports and waterways, I think is slated for 2024, 2025, I believe. And our colleagues in the Office of Freight and Commercial Vehicle Operations are the ones that lead that effort. We also have several individuals, including Met Council Steve Elmer, that serves on the Minnesota Freight Advisory Committee. And I am sure that they are beginning to have conversations around what that could look like given the policy draft policy direction in the SMTP. Okay, thank you. The last one is this, could you just, uh, it won't be the plan and I'll review it uh, again, but as far as electric charging stations, can you talk a little bit more about that with you know, bikes and cars, like what that looks like to uh, encourage more electric car and bike uh, purchasing and what does the plan look like for that? Chair, committee members, uh, under the leadership of Siri Simons, we just submitted the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Plan that was required by the federal government to be able to spend some of the EV charging dollars that will be coming in. There is an added complexity in Minnesota in particular that we are not able to uh, invest in EV charging in state highway right away. So we'll require substantial collaboration with public and private sector partners to be able to implement that work. But the NEVI plan, as it's called, was one of the first significant commitments that we made to be able to tap into those federal dollars and will be updated on an annual basis. It does prioritize 94 and um, 35 as our two primary corridors for the first year of investment, but will be evaluated on an ongoing basis. Okay, thank you. All right, any additional? Council Member Chambliss. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, my, my question is, um, I, I liked uh, looking at the health aspect of um, transportation plan and um, looking at a combination of the goal for more walking and the safe system approach, uh, seeing those together um, is comforting. Uh, I hope that we're looking at uh, choice and opportunity as well um, because um, we can build in the opportunity for people to walk, we can design for people to walk, but there are times and maybe choices where people may want to or need to drive whether it be for um, you know their disability, or um, you know a lack of parking, or a need to get groceries and things like that that they have to cart, 
um, how, how can we resolve those, for those issues to increase the opportunity for walking? Um, more people are ordering, you know, their food and groceries or, um, you know, pre-ordering them for pickup. Maybe um, as we evolve to more walking, we also evolve to changing our structures so that um, it fits in with people's choice and the opportunities that go along with those choices. Absolutely. Uh, Council Member Chambliss, Chair, Committee Members, uh, it's part of the reason why we emphasize in uh, much of the plan and especially around vehicle miles traveled that the emphasis is on options. We're trying to provide more and better options for people to be able to meet their daily needs. And going forward, we will need to rely even more on partnerships like with MPOs, counties, cities, to be able to make sure that those choices are available to people because a lot of it is on a neighborhood scale. It's like those one to three mile uh, travel decisions that you're making, which are often outside the purview of MnDOT. Um, so see more calls for partnership in the near and long term to be able to make good on opportunity and choice also, we are also developing a measure for multimodal accessibility to give us more information about what is available. Thank you. Councilmember Pacheco. Yes, Madam Chair. Members, um, under equity, I, I don't see anything uh, for economic impact and how our transportation feeds into that and what that, that has for either BIPOC communities or other communities. Uh, committee member, chair, we did not include low income in our transportation equity definition. Uh, we had a many engaged debate of how, how far do we include groups of people because when you include everybody, it's a definition about nothing for nobody. And in collaboration with our equity work group, uh, advisement from a, a thousand Minnesotans, we decided to focus on racial equity primarily because much of our other policies had been silent <clears throat> on race, but we did have other policies that consider low income, for example, environmental justice. It's not to say that it's the right decision, but we felt given the current times that we are living that we needed to be pointed about race. Uh, also, data does show that race and income are closely related, uh, that a lot of lower, not exclusively, but a lot of lower income folks are BIPOC, so we do account for some of that in that commitment. Councilman Pacheco. Yeah, I guess I wasn't referring just to the income, but the economic opportunities for jobs and where the developments are going. I mean, we, when we um, have sites or, or, or look at uh, our, our patterns and, and deciding where our trains and buses and everything are going, we, often we tout how much economic impact they make and the new, new uh, developments around these stops. But not, and and it's, it's impressive. And it does have an impact, uh, but I don't see it as, I guess it's kind of glaringly absent from a, a <coughs> transportation plan. Uh, definitely glaringly absent from my summary. I think you'll find in the Healthy Equitable Communities objective that we have more information on economic vitality as it relates to transportation. Councilmember Fredson. Thank you, Chair. I had a follow-up uh, question on the right-of-way. Uh, two questions. One is uh, my assumption is that's state law and it's not a MnDOT policy or rule. Um, and then my second part of that question is, does that apply to rest areas also? Uh, Chair, uh, committee member, we uh, honestly, I don't know. Uh, I do try to stay out of state policy whenever possible, even though I deliver a policy plan. I will follow up with you on the, the parameters of that. I, I think it does apply to um, rest areas, but rather than speculate, I will just follow up with information directly. Thanks. Okay. Any additional? Councilmember Chambliss. Um, I, I just want to say that um, I agree with Councilmember um, Pacheco in terms of emphasizing more the economic <coughs> impacts as we do our planning. That is really important, the socioeconomic impacts um, and objectives, um, because the objective may be to, um, to, to lift um, BIPOC communities in different uh, ways um, and to ensure that um, where in the past uh, there has not been uh, benefits from some of our transportation projects, uh, that uh, we see that more. And if we, if we don't uh, have that as a goal or as a priority, then um, we have less of a chance to have a, 
a bigger impact than we do today. Councilmember Sterner. Thank you, Chair. I, just a feedback on that. I think like uh, thinking globally by having like local <coughs> pockets of development makes a big difference. So if we can walk to doctor's appointments, the grocery store, drug store, instead of have used transit to go out of a neighborhood and that, I think it was a huge impact with our carbon footprint as well. And then the jobs stay local as well. So I think uh, I think that'd be a huge thing to, to look at that uh, piece in. Thank you. Um, any additional questions or comments? All right. Thank you, Holly. Thank you, Thanks, Chair. Steve. Thanks, Committee. And if you go to the link in the presentation, it actually takes you to the draft plan, so then you can dig into some of the questions that had come up. Okay. All right. Uh, next, we're on to our last um, uh, item. It's the Q2 ridership. It's John Harper and Eric Land. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and committee members. Uh, I'm pleased to be here on our first attempt at presenting this this presentation this quarter. Uh, I am John Harper. I'm manager of contracted services and MTS. And with me, as usual, is Eric Lind, who is the manager of data and analytics at Metro Transit. And before we move into the formal presentation, if you would indulge me just a moment, I want to just make some comments that uh, re react to a couple of things made earlier. Uh, specifically, I want to talk about Route 467's implementation this morning with the PIC, and just want to uh, share the uh, story of collaboration between uh, Metro Transit staff and MTS staff in getting a route out there that uh, had a real uh, political clamoring to have service put back into Lakeville, and we found a way to, to put uh, good quality service out there. And um, you know, so, uh, as uh, Director Carlson mentioned uh, earlier, that you know we implemented under contract the Route 467. Uh, we were asked to do that because Metro Transit has uh, been experiencing the driver shortages that we're all aware of, the operator shortages. When the question first came to MTS, the service plan that was laid out had a lot of single trip uh, service on it. And we looked at that and said this will be really hard for any any uh, contractor or Metro Transit to fill. And we asked service development to take a look at the service plan. And what came back was uh, three morning runs of two trips each and three afternoon runs of two trips each, which made uh, essentially uh, eight hours of split work for three drivers. And so we were able to go to First Transit and they were able to go to their drivers and actually have some relatively senior drivers pick the work because we created um, a relatively uh, um, nice package of, of work for them. And so I just want to say you know, thank you to all those involved. Uh, oh, and also mention we transferred vehicles between divisions in order to make this, uh, this service a reality. So you know, there were a lot of people involved in moving this from, from request or, or concept into the implementation. So it's a nice story of how the, the two divisions within the council uh, interacted and, and really collaborated well together. So, um, and we had the service on the street this morning, carried a few people, uh, not so many, but that word will get out and, uh, and people will hopefully uh, move to this park and ride from some of the other places where they've been getting service. So, uh, success story for us. Now on to the, thank you for indulging me, on to the formal presentation. Uh, <clears throat> this is, uh, Second quarter ridership uh, 2022, and the news here is good. Uh, I will talk about the summary statistics here, the summary ridership, and hand it over to Eric to talk about a, uh, a little bit down in, into the weeds. So this first uh, graph here shows that we continue to be ahead of 2021 as we move through the first half of 2022. Uh, we are up. Uh, you know, uh, more than the 3.5 million rides a month, uh, which is up, uh, you know, no noticeably from uh, 2021. This bar chart here shows that uh, the local service and the light rail service are the, the largest gains. 
Uh, you can see that as, as we move uh, into the larger ridership, those continue to be larger uh, portions of the overall uh, service delivery with, with local bus service being nearly 60% and light rail service being nearly 30% of the service overall. This uh, shows in numbers those uh, the same data, and you can see here the bus ridership and light rail ridership are up uh, roughly 25% each. The North Star ridership, you know, starting from a much smaller number, is up 112%. So um, that continues to be very much a success. And then the other uh, programs that we operate uh, continue to grow. Those. Uh, continue to grow more, much more modestly, but the, the trend is up uh, in uh, our two dollar ride uh, programs, our two demand responsive programs, and then our BAM pool program. So just to, as we usually do here, to split out the bus service into its types of service, not just the mode, you can see that once again, all the service is up. Uh, the express service is up dramatically from, uh, from last year. Uh, you know, I think the Route 467 is one example of the, of the demand now coming back to that express market and the request coming in for adding express service back into the mix, and we can see that here uh, with a 70% uh, increase in the express ridership year to year. So that is a summary of where we're at. It's good. We're up. Uh, all modes, all types of service are, are continuing to dig out of the hole that that is the COVID pandemic. And I'll turn the presentation uh, over to Eric here to talk about uh, understanding the ridership trends. Thanks. Uh, nice to be with you all again. Yeah, it, it, this is sor sort of in response to questions that we've been getting, uh, including from some council members recently about what to make of these increases and what to make of other factors that might either promote or, um, you know, um, disincentivized ridership. And so I just wanted to kind of go back to basics a little bit on how we try to understand these things in our uh, area. And really, we start with this basic premise that it's an intersection of supply and demand. And what I mean by that is when we have ridership, it is a combination of somebody with a decision to travel, whether that's a habitual decision, like I go downtown every day, or uh, you know, a one-off decision, I want to go to the you know, concert uh, that has to interact with an opportunity that we're providing to supply that ride for that person. So they have to be able to get from A to B on our service. And, and the reason it's really helpful, especially the last two years, to break it apart into these two components is that they're moving differently. So for a long time in the beginning of the pandemic, we were providing pretty much all the opportunities we were providing before, but there was a lot fewer people out there deciding to travel and certainly in, in the same way that they were before. And now we're in a period where, um, as evidenced by our, our growth in ridership, there is a lot more travel happening. There's a lot more habitual travel beginning to happen again. And our, you know, our opportunities that we're providing are becoming more constrained, in part because of our uh, difficulty with the operator workforce. So um, just to think about these two components, when we think about ridership, it's really the intersection of them. So I'll try to get to that a little bit more as we go forward. So as, as an example of kind of how we think about these things, you know, you get the question of, you know, how does X change ridership? How do, how do high gas prices recently change ridership? How do people's feelings about safety change ridership? How, you know, how does even, you know, this new um, development change ridership? Um, and I'll just walk through a little bit of how we think about that. Uh, what I'm showing you here is, is every weekday on the blue line, colored blue, and the green line, colored green, uh, since the beginning of 2021 up through um, July. And what you can see is that both of these lines are up, if you kind of look from the beginning of this time series to the end, but they're up in really different ways. And the other thing you can notice is that there's a lot of variation from day to day, even where the, the kind of smoother trend that's up there is level, there's a lot of variation happening day to day. Okay. So our job is to kind of understand this and as a, as a you know, an output metric of ridership to kind of dig into the combination of, you know, service we're providing and demand that's there to understand where these trends are going. So uh, as an example, if you look at the blue line, you can see that there's kind of a steady increase over time. 
And then there's a little bit of dip around January 2022, and then it goes back somewhat to its prior trend. And knowing that the blue line has a higher percentage of, let's say, downtown office commute uh, trip purposes based on our onboard surveys that we do, uh, that makes sense in the context of more and more people going to work in an office situation like they were before. So there's kind of this steady increase. The green line, on the other hand, uh, as you well know, is really um, interacts strongly with the University of Minnesota. So what you're seeing there with these two bumps, you know, at beginning of fall and then at a little smaller echo in spring, is really the academic calendar kicking in and the amount of use that's happening around the U of M at that time. Obviously, there's a lot of other purposes and destinations on the green line, but that's really a driver of that major pattern. Okay. So uh, we're looking at this. We see this dip around January. Um, what we remember uh, and hope to not have repeat was that we had a pretty major new variant of COVID show up, Omicron. And actually, that changed that whole um, desire to travel. Many more people were um, either quarantining or their workplaces and schools were closing, uh, albeit temporarily because of that Omicron. And additionally, our ability to supply the trips was constrained because a lot of our operator workforce was under the same um, you know, infection. So we, that kind of explains that dip. But what we want to know is going forward, you know, how do all these other things play into it? Uh, for instance, once you know, we're uh, implementing our, our safety and security action plan, Right, and you'll be hearing regular updates about how that's going. The purpose of that is to, again, reassure people and let people know that it's safe and um, reliable to be on board transit. As we implement that uh, over this time period, this summer and fall, um, what we want to know is how does that impact ridership? Well, in order to measure that, we sort of have to track this ridership uh, graph forward through time. right? And we can look at what the trend is right now and we have to do this sort of counterfactual to say, like, OK, if, you know, if we hadn't uh, done these programs and reassured people, um, how would the trend have gone versus if, since we did, what difference do we see? And the challenge in that is that variation that you see all along. And so what, what happens is that conclusion can only be drawn after a good uh, amount of time. And in some cases, really can't be drawn very well at all because of the underlying movement of the the trend in the system. Similarly, with uh, the University of Minnesota, uh, we're about to, to institute um, a universal pass for all University of Minnesota students. They'll have their student ID, be their transit pass. It's super exciting. Uh, it's going to open up, uh, hopefully, a new world of customers for us. And we are looking for the ridership to increase as a, res as a result. Um, at the same time, you know, in our new service changes, we're um, down to 15 minute uh, frequency on the green line. So is that going to be an impediment to either the number of people we can carry or the number of people who consider it to be a useful service? Maybe, maybe not. That's one of the things we'll be watching to see whether that supply of the trips is keeping up with the demand. So uh, in other words, we have a balance of factors. We have a lot of things that we're looking at. All of these have influence, uh, but they really come together in such complicated ways that it's very hard to answer how does X impact ridership. And I hope that's uh, what I'm trying to convey today. So because some of the things that we know are happening that are good news and, and supporting this you know, 20 to 25% increase in our ridership over this first two quarters, uh, <coughs> there is increased regular trip making to downtowns and to other uh, work centers, which, which are continuing to grow. We've got uh, not just the U of M, but other local universities. Of course, we've got the high school service uh, to Minneapolis and St. Paul Public Schools. Uh, those are great things for our ridership, on a, like a real daily um, you know, rider. We know that as our service is reliable and on time, that more people will use it. Uh, we do know gas prices change people's you know, um, attitudes to, towards different modes. And um, while we would never root for high gas prices, we understand that's a, it's a potential for us to take advantage of that. Uh, by supplying trips. On the other side of the ledger, um, you know, we have these constraints on the ability to provide service, and uh, we need to overcome those. But in the meantime, we do have fewer opportunities out there for people to get on board. Uh, we know that cheap parking is, is not um, something that helps us understand how people get on board, because 
if they can drive with less traffic and park very cheaply, in some cases downtown Minneapolis for less than the price of an express round trip ticket, it makes it hard to convince people to try transit instead. Um, telework favors fewer rides. It definitely helps meet the lower VMT goal that we are hearing about from MnDOT, but it doesn't you know, support people using our service. And then of course we do have uh, these experiences or perceptions of safety and security that we're working, we're concentrating on. Uh, but those do deter riders somewhat. So, um, oh, and then, of course, uh, COVID is still present. And while we um, hope that we're kind of through with these, these major waves of the pandemic, I don't think at this point it's wise to rule out that that would ever happen again. Um, one more thing I just wanted to go through is uh, the kind of state of the downtown commute. This is something that is uh, a hot question for a lot of people. Two, looking at Minneapolis here, you know, kind of how many people are coming down regularly versus what was happening, um, you know, say in 2019. Uh, so on the left, you see our Minneapolis uh, transit, metro transit data for boardings heading outbound in the PM peak on weekdays. So um, you can see the day of week there, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Friday being pretty noticeably lower. Kind of looks like from our data here that Tuesday, Wednesday are pretty popular in office days. Friday and Monday telework days, that kind of resonates with a lot of um, patterns we see in this office. Uh, overall, we're be you know, between 20 and 26% of what we were pre-COVID for these downtown boardings. And um, again, that sounds low, but then when you look at the right-hand side of this, which is the, uh, the peak utilization in the ABC ramps, which are those MnDOT ramps on the west side of downtown, just over here, uh, downtown Minneapolis. That's showing that they are also between 25 and maybe 40% utilized on a weekday, uh, even through 2022. So they've been growing through time, but they're still well, well below what they were uh, pre-COVID. And to me, you know, with the exception of those, you know, spikes, which are twins day games, which you could probably have guessed. But so what, you know, what that says to me is that this, this um, distance between what we're seeing now and what was happening is not unique to transit. It's, not, it's a general travel pattern that the downtowns are still a long way from as busy as they were pre-COVID. And that just reflects where we're at with telework and other um, you know, business practices that are going on. So um, with that, I'll just leave you with key takeaways. Uh, as John said, we're, we really are um, you know, feeling like we're building uh, a strong foundation. And in the first half of 2022, we see that office commute market growing. The all-day demand that we've been seeing all throughout the, the uh, pandemic has continued to be strong. And with the rest of 2022 in mind, we have that balance of factors. We know there's going to be strong demand in the fall from some of these things we've seen. We hope that our service changes can meet that demand and we end up with a ridership bump. Uh, and we are always going to be um, just watching the news for what the latest is with COVID and how that impacts people's travel. So with that, we'll stand for questions. Thank you. Are there questions or comments? Council members. Council member Sterner. Thank you, Madam Chair. My question is just how do you <coughs> count riders? What is the ex exact way you count riders? Uh, Chair and council member, thank you for that question. Uh, it differs by mode. So on the fixed route buses that have the fare box at the front as you pay as you get on, the fare box system and the go-to card system are used to count those rides. For the systems like light rail and BRT, where there isn't a fare box that you pay attached to the vehicle, but you pay off board, we have automatic passenger counters, which are essentially like light beam detectors that are above every door. And they do a pretty good job of counting boardings and, and exits, boardings and alightings. Uh, so we actually use um, a sampling of those to um, say how many people have ridden each type of service. Thank you. And then Madam Chair and uh, council, uh, committee member, on, on our demand response services, we run uh, software that schedules all of that for us and we track the ridership within that software. We know the boardings and the lightings uh, through that software system. Okay, uh, Council Member Pacheco, oh, sorry, go ahead. Madam Chair, and I, I want uh, uh, Eric to Correct me if I'm wrong, but also when we use the door counters, uh, we we have a uh, discount on 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 door 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 passes. We have a, a statistical discount on ridership 
based upon door passes, it may not be, it's not a perfect count, so we have a discount on it to address the uh, uh, multiple passes by one individual. Okay. Right. Council Member Pacheco. Yes, I, um, I was just thinking about uh, this week the fair starts. And it seemed to me that's a great opportunity to, to get people on buses. I used I take the bus to the fair every year uh, when it when it's when it's open, but yet we're down to three. And some of the bigger ones we're not. It seems to me we're losing two opportunities. One is to increase our ridership. Two to to get people to see that we we are still accommodating as a broader group of people as we can. And um, I'm, so I'd just like to see how why we would do that. <laughs> Actually, I'll call General yeah, Manager Koyster. Madam Chair, I'll do my best to respond. You know, it really comes down to the operator shortage and and the commitment that we're making to our re to reliability on our regular route bus service, our regular customers. You're right, we lose those opportunities. We don't want it to be down to three sites for state fair. We'd rather be serving all the sites that we served before on state fair. But we have to make this decision between reliability on our, on our with our regular route users and our regular users and, and loss of significant reliability by overextending our operators. So it really comes down to the workforce shortage that we're experiencing the operators in so many other places. And uh, I'm sorry that that's the impact of it. I truly am because we, our operators love that work. They absolutely love that state fair work. And it, it's, it's a hard decision to make and frankly, uh, one that we agonize over every year with the last couple of years that we've been in this situation. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a comment though, I mean, but we're talking 10 days. I mean, we're not talking about a year's worth of work or, or uh, really, um, I don't know how much of an impact it has on your day to day, having this 10 days where people can come and go to the fair and have a decent ride and come back and forth. They're not parking downtown are down uh, over there, they're, uh, anyway, I think we're missing an opportunity, even not just to provide a service, but also to, to show people they can get back on a, on a bus. Um, and I think that's important. There's no questions or comments from council members? All right, thank you. And thank you for keeping this up with providing us the information with some context and some of the impacts. I think that this has really been a good way to look at this data um, because we're kind of getting, instead of just looking at the ridership no numbers, we're getting some of the story behind it, which I think is very, very helpful for us as we're looking at new service or new changes and things like that. So I thank learned, you. I learned something new from Eric every quarter. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think it's really been great. I think it's really a, a great improvement. It's how we do this because, like I said, just that context really makes a big difference. So thank you, gentlemen. Um, with that, that's the end of our um, uh, agenda items today. So I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Moved by Council Member Sterner. Is there a second? Second. Second by Council Member Chambliss. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. And we're adjourned. <laughs>